listening to Overwatch League Daily, your daily source for Overwatch League news, scores, and more. Here's your host, Kicked Tripod. Good morning, Overwatch League fans. Here's your Overwatch League Daily episode for January 4th, 2018. On today's show, I'm going to be joined by Winston's Lab writer and Overwatch analyst, Yiska. We're going to be discussing some of the differences between Eastern and Western competitive Overwatch and how Overwatch League is going to affect that going forward. The story of the past decade in esports has to be the dominance of Korean players with a robust training schedule, a culture of discipline, and the ability to play against other top rosters Korea has been the top region for esports talent for a long time, and Overwatch is by no means an exception. However, the gap is narrowing. Western players are given more structure, more opportunities to make a living, and are often able to play some of the top rosters in the world more consistently than just the top and largest tournaments of the year. The tide is turning, but it is still leaving many unconvinced as multiple rosters invested heavily in Korean players and three Overwatch League rosters are 100% from Korea. Overwatch writer and analyst Yiska presents a different perspective, that there aren't any more good excuses for Western players' lack of results. So let's start there. The Spitfire Dynasty and NYXL are generally placed in the top four, and those are the three all-Korean rosters in Overwatch League. This is obviously a loaded question, But what are the primary reasons that South Korean teams have outperformed Western teams this far? (laughs) Well, then let me try to unload that question a little bit, because depending on how important you think location is, there is an argument that could be made that Western teams and South Korean teams actually haven't met each other often on neutral grounds and only ever in South Korea, with the exception of the World Cup, which I don't like to draw conclusions from. Now, I am Gyeonggi. Apex Season 1, Apex Season 2, and Apex Season 3 were all played in South Korea, and one of which was won, Apex Season 1, by Envious, a Western team. Now, already that doesn't look that grim, right? Now, if we look to the more recent future, meaning Apex Season 2, Apex Season 3, and Apex Season 4, in the last season where no Western teams competed in anymore, yes, the level of play does look much more convincing than in the West across the board. Now, if we're thinking about reasons why that is, I think location remains a big thing because the surrounding ecosystem in South Korea has always been praised across esports history as a formidable ground to grow new talent. Their solo queue is often regarded of much higher quality. And that is also obviously a cultural approach because if more people take it seriously, you have a bigger talent pool to draw from and more high quality practice. High quality practice is also another thing. For the longest time, the best Western teams were extracted out of the West and competed in South Korea and therefore sort of robbed the upcoming talent to practice against these best teams so no inner ecosystem, snowball system could happen. So that certainly set the West back a little bit. But also the lack of tournaments, especially in the case of Europe, where nothing much was happening and only small community efforts were made. And only ever then contenders helped a little bit, by which we then also saw large improvements in the level of play across the West. So if we're asking why did South Korea outperform the West, and if we agree with that premise, it has to be based in location and cultural differences between the players. And I think now that we are arrived in LA, at least for the first season, this can no longer be mentioned as an excuse for Westerners to end up for. There are some people who would attribute uh, Korean players outperforming Western players simply to just overabundance of skill. But in your opinion, how big of a difference is that skill gap versus other factors like discipline, practice time, and competitive play time? Okay, let's break this down one by one. So for skill, what I understand as skill is basically mechanics, which could be how you move across the map. So your movement ability to 
come over certain obstacles. That could be trick jumps, that could be how you hover with Farah and whatever. Then certainly um, aim is one part of uh, mechanics, which is part of skill. Then positioning could be seen as part of your skill. Uh, and certainly also your awareness of what is happening in the game. So to just be able to absorb and then at the same time compute the entire information that is being plastered at you at every given moment, either by voice or by the game itself. And that all comes from those f factors of practice. So you can practice all these things, right? And you practice those by being disciplined, by having a lot of practice time, by being rigorous in your practice. And... Competitive playtime, I assume this would hint towards solo queue. Yes, this is also where it happens more. Now, let's not forget, and which is kind of funny if you think about it, there's still a, a bunch of players around from the very early beta days. Like, for instance, Clockwork Seagull is one. Um, cool Matt. These players have been competitive players since the first week of the beta. And were participating in tournaments, and yes, some of them took breaks, to be fair. But the duration they've participated in doesn't seem to matter much anymore. And the reason for that is, is that the environment a player practices in is extremely important. And this also adds to the answer of the first question. You can only ever really improve if the per people you're playing against sort of can catch up. There are very few ins instances over sports history as well as uh, esports history where someone out of himself can improve to a point where others can catch up and then we think of them as transcendent talents such as you know flash or um for instance a faker but even they had always had their rivals that keep kept pushing them to new heights like a jadong or for faker there have been many mid players uh, in that regard so if we're talking about the differences between Korean and Western players in that regard, as I said, because they're all in that one environment now, it's very likely that there aren't any differences anymore. And the only real issues that could arise from there is that maybe the selection process for Korean players has been more rigorous because they had better competition, they had a bit of bigger talent pool, and then it could be that the selection of these Korean players are just a little bit more talented than the Western players. This is by no means proven, but it, that's basically the only concession I will make towards my point that maybe the slightest bit, if we had a bit more Western tournaments, we could have had a better selection of talent. Yes, that is entirely possible. But this is as far as... I want to give up ground in saying that the playing field isn't equal. And if we're being honest, I don't think a Western player should really consider this a factor and should say, you know, maybe I'm less talented, therefore it's okay to not win Overwatch League. No, I don't think talent matters that much in that regard. And I think at the end, it all comes down to who sits the longest, who has the best practice, who works the best with their teammates. And in the end... This is also why we watch sports, isn't it? I think at the end of the day, uh, what is special about Overwatch League is that it does level that playing field. There's no real excuses to practice less, to play less when you're getting paid a salary, health benefits, you have a dedicated practice area that's away from your living area that uh, it, it really takes out the uh, ability to make those excuses as a professional player. So with that in mind, do you think we'll see Western players regarded as the same as many of the best Korean players? In terms of individual talent, yes, this is very likely to happen. Even in other esports, that was true. Whenever Westerners with the grit and determination to go to Korea and grind it out and hone their craft and sort of find it in themselves to do as much as the Koreans then yes, there's no reason why that shouldn't be happening. There's no genetic reasoning why Koreans are better at video games. Let's be honest here. So it has always been much harder to create those teams that are on the same level. But it, as a matter of individual talent, yes, 
I, there's no doubt in my mind that at the end of Overwatch League, we will think of some of those Western players equal to the best Korean players. And yes, maybe there will be one or two players that will stand above the rest. And yes, those might be Koreans, superstars. But star level players, yes, I think we will see quite a few Western players in that category. I think sometimes when we look at esports, it's really easy to just look at results as success for Overwatch players. But what would you define as success for a Western player playing in the Overwatch League? I think this is contextual to the player that we're talking about. But let me say that all of them should realize that a player, for instance, like Profit, who has basically nobody in the middle of 2017, rose to fame, won it all with GC Busan in Apex Season 4, and during that time possibly had the highest peak of an individual player we've ever seen across a tournament. So I don't know why anyone would then be satisfied now that all is in one place they all have the same tools while well, one would be satisfied with just being the best western player no we're not playing for this golden pineapple we western players have to realize yes this is our chance to become the actual world's best something that was really interesting about the dallas fuel uh, before they were the dallas fuel with team envious is they were probably one of the most diverse teams that we've actually seen in competitive Overwatch. You have Effect, who is from uh, Korea, sorry. And then you've also got Custa, who is in Australia. And then you've got Mickey from Thailand. And then you've got quite a few different players from kind of the, the, the Central Europe area. And that kind of makes it an interesting idea when we look at these rosters of what actually makes a roster a Western roster? I think commonly we refer to Western rosters as teams that have a lot of Western players on them and that also participated in the Western scene. Now, these obviously seem to overlap a lot. So yes, no, Dallas Fuel is not suddenly a Korean roster. But it certainly, it makes you think how useful these terminologies are actually in practice and how at the end of Overwatch League Season 1, they remain useful as terms as such. Because if we do see a wide array of performances across the board, so there is no intrinsic quality that we can assign to South Korean teams that by which they win because they're South Korean, then it doesn't make sense to differentiate them as such. Then the only real reason, reason they are different is then the country of origin, and that isn't interesting to me as a fan of Overwatch. But as long as there are different properties expressed in the game, expressed in the team play, that you can clearly pinpoint to the location where they learned this from, then yes, it, it, these terms remain useful in a sense and as long as that is the case i will continue to use them but i don't at all dabble in that tribalistic pleasure of saying like enables you no, that's not what i compete in and that's why i hope that at the end of overwatch league we see that term western korean roster less and less because ultimately it shouldn't matter it's just about the best teams i think you bring up an interesting point and so i want to actually skip ahead to a different question one that we had planned, and that is what impacts on the Overwatch League's future success may come if the West is not able to maintain its ground with Korea in the coming seasons? Well, let me tackle that premise of that question first. Because yes, I think on average we can see that Korean players have been dominating in terms of level of play and also the tournaments, at least for half a year now. Probably longer, but I don't think that this necessarily means that every team needs to go Korean in order to maximize their chance of winning. The reason I think that is, is for instance, take a roster like London that has already now specialized in Koreans. So they brought over the two best teams that are available outside 
the Lunatic High roster, which was KDP and GC Busan. And what is the future going to hold? Let's, let's think this through. Three years down the line, either their team is still with them, or they will likely be sold off somewhere. Do we still think that they are the absolute best talent that came out of Korea? It's very unlikely that they will maintain their level for that long of time. So let's suppose for that thought experiment that they won't. So what is, who is to say that the level of them, because they were ripped out of their environment of South Korea and they're now not enjoying all these bonuses of better solo queue, better practice and scrim environments. And keep in mind, this is in a time when this team is already in London. So it's not in Korea anymore. Who's to say that another player from Europe couldn't potentially, after that long of a time, compete with them. And who's to say you couldn't make up a roster of all these people that could compete with them. Now, will they win the league? I think the biggest factor in answering that question will be to see how Overwatch develops as an esport in Korea. Because we've seen as long as Korea stays culturally engaged with a game, they continue to produce talent. But we've already recently seen that the PC Bang percentages of share, how much people play Overwatch, has dropped drastically. So if it, that was to continue, in the games that Korea wasn't as interested in, they always had some talent, but they were never really the absolute dominant faction. So I think it's quite likely that if Overwatch stays relevant in the West as an esport, but loses a little bit of traction in Korea, that we will see Western players at least on the same level. And because it, also because of marketability, I don't think that it will ever be a problem for Westerners to find a slot if they are good enough. That is to say that they can also replace other Westerners. So that excuse doesn't particularly convince me that there is a problem there. So Yiska, I, I gave you a pretty challenging task. I asked you to take uh, your article that you wrote for Winston's Lab about uh, there's no more excuses left uh, as far as the differences between uh, West and East Overwatch and probably esports as a whole, if I could infer that into your article. But I gave you kind of a really ethereal topic then today to, to try and help us understand more some of these finer points but something that's not as simple as who's going to win, who's going to lose, but instead defining and trying to define the different aspects of the competitive esports scene right now and why they're important. I need to give you an opportunity to just make some closing statements and put a bow on this <laughs> so that you get everything out that you need to. So let me make a distinction between probability and possibility. So if someone was to ask me, at this point in time, who was going to win the next Overwatch League match or who they should put on their Fantasy League roster, I would have to answer with a Korean name. Now, that doesn't mean that Westerners are therefore excused for not giving that their all and not realizing that the surrounding circumstances that have kept them down are no longer relevant. So, if Westerners can embrace that opportunity and realize, yes, now we have the possibility, we have all the tools, we have the environment, it's all on us to do what we need to do in order to win. And it's also on the fans to hold the players to that standard, to realize that it's no longer, in air quotes, okay to lose to Koreans. I think then we'll have a very interesting season one, and possibly even Season 2, if the league doesn't go global, and if games still happen in LA for Season 2, by which point that window would be extended. So at least for Season 1, possibly for Season 2, the gap between Korean and Western rosters will be at an all-time low, and I think there's a lot of enjoyment we can derive from that. <laughs> My thanks to Yiska for stopping by and sharing his thoughts on the show today. Make sure to follow him on Twitter at Yiska Out. On tomorrow's show, I'm going to be joined by Nuki. 
and we're going to be discussing some of the finer points of Overwatch contenders in light of Overwatch League, preparing Overwatch contenders players, and just a lot of cool uh, topics that honestly only someone like Nuki can address. Nuki has incredible experience with Overwatch contenders, player management, tournament admin, moderating. Uh, she's a top 500 player. It's it's unreal how much expertise she has in Overwatch, and I'm really excited to get to chat with her tomorrow. Uh, remember, you can find the show on your favorite podcast outlets, including iTunes, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and yes, we are back on SoundCloud as well. And of course, you can find us on the front page of winstonslab.com as well. We're on YouTube also. Click on the link in the show notes to find us. And if you want to stay in touch, email me at overwatchleaguedaily at gmail.com. Tweet me at Show or what else? Uh, join our Discord. There it is. Join our Discord at discord.me slash OWL daily show. You can also find links to all of that because it's way too much to remember at overwatchleaguedaily.com. Thank you so much for stopping by for today's episode. We'll be back tomorrow with another one.